Genesis 17. Genesis 17. Everything's quiet at our house this week. We have eight grandkids. So it's real quiet and clean. Actually, what I do, I just put Cameron in charge, and he rides the four-wheeler all over the place. (laughs) Okay, Genesis 17. This is about the death of a nation. Uh, You study the Old Testament to see how God deals with nations. And a nation is just, you know, a bunch of uh, the same people, a bunch of individuals. Uh, And you can be real technical on it. A nation is usually one race of people, like in Japan, it's a Japanese people. In uh, Liberia, it's a black race. Uh, The United States did begin as for the white race. Now, of course, that's going to be branded racist, but that's how she started, and it's not wrong to try to honor your heritage. Uh, People say, you know, diversity is, uh, you know, the secret and everything, but it's not in sports. The Cubs don't put a Cardinals third base coach and a White Sox first base coach, and they don't advertise for the White Sox. A good sports team is fanatical about one thing. Okay, but where did this idea of nations begin? And then there's a certain nation that God chose to be an example to all nations. So what we can do is we read about that nation, and then we compare our nation to that nation, and then we can see where we're at on the time scale. So Genesis 17, this is where it began, verse 1. Uh, let's go ahead and pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand, help us to have eyes we might see, ears we might hear, and we ask for understanding. We ask for inspiration, the inspiration of God, that we might understand our times. And we pray that, uh, especially the older generation, that we would become great prayer warriors for the younger generation and to try to help them to endure the great temptations that they're faced with. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, chapter 17. When Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Okay, so there's the example. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. Okay, this is where he gave them a land grant. So it's a meet and bounds method. If you read it in Genesis 15, it's a meet and bounds where he starts here and then it goes here and then it comes up here and it goes here. And you go to any Christian bookstore and look at a Bible map and try to find a Bible map of the original land grant and you won't find it. Because the Christians don't want to tell you about it. Uh, there's a spirit that is involved with that. Now I'm going to run several places. If you want to try to keep up, okay, try to keep up. Genesis 18:18. 18, 18. This is Abraham appealing to God about Sodom and Gomorrah. He says this, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and, a great and mighty nation. Now notice it's singular here. A great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. <clears throat> so the singular nation we know to be Old Testament Israel. All the other nations are branching out from that. So Israel becomes the select sample to all nations. So as Israel goes, so goes all other nations. Genesis 22, verse 18. 
Okay, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. So that's Abraham. <clears throat> so God made an agreement, a covenant, a contract with a guy named Abraham about uh, that he is going to eventually, his children, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, all that stuff, is going to be a peculiar nation, a very unusual nation. And that's going to be an example to all nations. Okay, so we know that in the Bible to be Israel, the nation of Israel. The E-L on the name Israel, the E-L is God. So it's his name. Okay, and uh, so Israel was chosen by God to be an example to all nations. <clears throat> now we're going to stick <clears throat> in the Pentateuch for now, Deuteronomy chapter 7. The first five books of the Bible lay the groundwork, except, ex, uh, ex, especially Exodus and Deuteronomy. Leviticus lays the groundwork of religious Judaism. Deuteronomy lays the ground for, groundwork for political Judaism. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7 reveals there's seven nations that have been um, intermingled in the land of Israel, not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be further south, and God says, I'm kicking them out. Now, if we, if we discover why he kicked them out, then we discover why nations die. Deuteronomy 7, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whether thou goest to possess it and hath cast out many nations before thee. And here's the name of them, the Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. These are the Ike cousins. And then it says seven nations, verse 1, greater and mightier than thou. They had giants. They had guys that were... Uh, 12, 15 feet tall, that's who they were fighting, that's who they were going against. Big, huge giants. One of those guys <clears throat> had a bed that was, <clears throat> I think, nine cubits long. If you make a cubit a foot and a half, that is a king-size bed. Okay, that is a th at least a minimum of a 13-foot bed. That'd be big. Okay, and so that's bigger than a king's size what we have nowadays. So when you read down through there, verse 2, you'll see, I'll try to skim down through some of this because there's a lot of scripture running through, laying a groundwork that the Old Testament reveals how God deals with nations. In verse 2, he says, I want you to destroy them. They're so far gone, I want them out. Gone. If you don't get them, they're going to get you. Uh, verse 3, he says, don't marry their girls. And don't let your boys marry their girls, and don't you marry their girls. Uh, verse 4, they serve other gods. You'll see about uh, a third into the verse. They serve other gods. Uh, verse 5, he said, I want you to destroy their altars. No religious tolerance here. Destroy their altars, destroy their images, break them down. And in Numbers 33, 52, he said, destroy their pictures. The word pictures is only found three times in the Bible. And in Numbers 33, 52, he said, destroy their pictures. All the new Bibles take that word out. And the reason why is when you have a picture, you have an image in your mind. And when you get this image in your mind, it's hard to burn it out. So he said, destroy all their pictures. He says in verse 6, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people. Unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So they become a very unique race of people. Okay, then he, what he, he get, begins to do in Exodus 34, he says, I'm going to increase your dominion. In Exodus 34, 24, he says, the people are going to be afraid of you. I'm going to put my fear of you on them. So why is he booting these nations out? Leviticus 18 gives one reason. Okay, Leviticus 18. <clears throat> now, Leviticus 18 is the Bible complete definition of a word uh, called fornication. Okay, forn rhymes with porn as in pornography. Okay, now today, the ones who are the biggest owners of the pop pornography in industry is Jewish people. The Jews, they have totally fallen away from the Bible. Apostate Jews. 
Okay, now Leviticus 18 is the Bible word for fornication. Sometimes if you read uh, state statutes, they'll define the words at the beginning of each of the statutes. So here's the definition. And then when you go into the read through, this word comes up. And then as you go back here and you see the whole definition. Leviticus 18 is the entire definition, the Bible definition of the word called fornication. Now the word's not here in this chapter it's in 1 Corinthians 5, and then 1 Corinthians 5 runs it back to Leviticus 18. And when you run down through there, verse 6, and you start seeing nakedness, this, nakedness, that, nakedness, this, all that stuff. Okay? In verse 22, he mentions sodomy. That's a Bible word. In verse 24, he says this, Defile not ye yourselves any of these things. For in all these, the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. He said, I'm done with it. When it gets this far, I'm done with it. In Romans 1, he says, I gave up on them. Okay, so that's the definition. Now, that's, you know, sort of kind of the, the fleshly aspect. But when you step up a spiritual aspect of the same sin, then you really got a mess. Okay, now the stepping up here is the spiritual aspect. And if you're in Leviticus 18, now run to Deuteronomy 18. Now, Deuteronomy is the uh, Bible passage that many of the uh, political documents of America was founded on, Deuteronomy. That's the main, it's it's like a handbook for a political commonwealth. Deuteronomy, and that's where a lot of the founding fathers read from. You'll find uh, tort laws in here, liability laws. You'll find criminal laws all in Deuteronomy, okay? And you'll even find the definition versus murder and manslaughter and all these things. The Bible covers all this stuff. Okay, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. This jumps into the spiritual aspect, the demonology, spiritism. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of these nations. Don't learn it. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. You say, what is that? That is child sacrifice. Why would they do that? You say, that don't happen anymore. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, Make a foolish statement like that. That's how people get satanic power and political power. Behind closed doors, if people knew what was going on, they'd be shocked. The Bible records it here. Then it says they use divination and observer of times. That's what Nancy Reagan did when she consults the stars when Ronald Reagan was traveling from here to there. An enchanter or a witch, that's the Democratic candidate for president. A charmer, a consultant with familiar spirits. I say that because she's admitted to consult um, Eleanor Roosevelt. That's right, Hillary Clinton consulted Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the wife of FDR in the 1940s. How did they do this? (laughs) And both are ADC, A- ACDC, back forth. You know, I mean, that's what they, if a person will do the research. Okay, a wizard or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. So that's when God, a nation, has got, I'm done with it. He just says, I'm done with a nation when it goes that far. This is why Rome went down. This is why Greece went down. Okay, Media, Persia, and Babylon. Every one of them toward the end. This is what happens. Okay, people, you know, often intellectual people, who will they quote of the days of Greece? Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. Aristotle was a private tutor of Alexander the Great. And he was, you know, uh, he was the LGBT community. That's where he, Aristotle was. And so was Plato. Why are they quoting these guys? 
Okay, and okay, uh, you know, you get talk about that the outward sins of a nation. Okay, when spiritism overcomes the nation, spiritism is witchcraft. Uh, you want to say Satanism, but a lot of people don't. They, they, when you say Satanism, they're thinking really bad. But witchcraft, uh, Wicca, uh, Pokemon, D and D, Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, all those things are part of that Spiritism aspect, and then the fleshly aspect is sodomy. Uh, Thursday, when I was driving home, I just happened to have the radio on, and the Trumpster was giving his acceptance speech. And about, you know, some part way through there, he gave more praise to the Sodomites. If you think they got killed down there, uh, um, Orlando, he gave more praise to them, the fine, good people, than over the police officers that got killed. He gave more praise to them. And I tell you, he would have gotten more votes... If he would have said the queers down there, if he would have used that word about a million redneck boys down in south with their chew in their box, man, I'm going to go vote for him. He would have got a lot more votes that way if he would have said that. But no way. They got to, I tell you, this is, it is, we are a snowball that is going down that cliff so fast. It is a shame. Now, if you go to the Jude, okay, Jude is the second to last book, or actually the last epistle of the Bible. Revelation is the last book, I guess you can say. Jude, verse 7. Now, 1997, when I was able to travel to Israel, uh, the tour bus that I was on, we drove past, or the bus drove past the place that we know to be Sodom. We didn't go in the site of Sodom. We did go in the site what is left over of Gomorrah. It's at the foot of Masada. Nobody goes there. Everybody goes to see Masada. Masada is a Jewish community that lived on top of this cliff. And about 900 folks lived up there. And the Romans were trying to conquer them. And they could never get to them because it was high up on a precipice. And nobody could get to them. But finally, the Romans did figure out how to get there. And because the Jews said that, hey, they're coming to kill us, they all committed really suicide. What they did is they said, we'd rather be dead than Romans. Masada. It's a pretty, pretty well-known site in Israel. But at the foot of it, and if you know what you're looking for, you could actually say, whoa, look at that. Nothing but a bunch of ashes, but it looks like ashes where there was a building here and ashes in a building here. There's some intelligent layout there, but you can see that it has turned to ashes. That's Gomorrah. That's Gomorrah. We went there. I have in my desk at home in a little box, a little sulfur. It's, uh, it ranges anywhere from little pebble stones to about that big. Sulfur. Sulfur is like blue flame on a cutting torch. That's what God rained down and blew that place off the map. And the reason why we can still find, because as anything, when flames go embed into the debris, it's the oxygen is smothered. And so you find it encapsulated inside Gomorrah. And I've been there. Okay, and so Jude verse 7, it says this, Even as Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. There's the fleshly aspect. And going after strange flesh. There's the spiritual aspect. Strange flesh. What's that? That's fallen angels. That's weird. And then it says, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Okay, and so this is where the term, now I'm just telling you where the term comes from. The term faggot is a term that that's a stick burning in a fire. In, in uh, England, still today, somebody might say to somebody, light this fag for me, and they're referring to a cigarette. Okay, and so that's where that term comes from. Okay, and this in verse 7, God is saying this is an example to everybody. And so what this is, this is God giving forewarning to any nation that if you go this far down this path, I give up. I'm done. 
Where's America at? Boy, it's gone. It's down there. I don't, you know, America's not dead, but boy, it sure is on life support. And when God decides to pull the plug, you know, where we're at, and I don't, I don't like saying that, but I don't want to stick my head in the sand either. Now, when Israel was conquered by another nation, the Bible describes it. 2 Kings chapter 17. So this is a very important chapter. 2 Kings 17 describes the political atmosphere, the religious atmosphere of Israel prior to God pulling the plug on Israel. And then uh, Iran came in and conquered them. Iran in the Bible is called Assyria or Syria. They became a world power. They came and conquered the ten northern tribes, Israel. And then a hundred years later, Iraq or Babylon came in and conquered Judah because Judah did the same thing. 2 Kings 17, verse 7. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. So when the believers of Israel feared other gods... Or Christians in our culture fear other God. What's that called? That's political correctness. Oh, no, you can't say anything bad about another person's faith. Oh, no, don't do that. Political correctness. What that is intended to do is shut the mouth of Christians. That's what's its intended purpose. To try to get us to be ashamed of our beliefs. They're not ashamed of theirs. And we shouldn't be ashamed of ours. Verse 8. They walked after the statutes of the heathen. Verse 9. The children of Israel did that, did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. Okay, they did some things secretly. That's the sacrifices of children, people. Outwardly, they built high places in all their cities from the Tower of the Watchman to Defense City. They set up their images and groves. So the images and groves outward, the obelisk, the Washington Monument, George Washington at the free, the uh, Mason thing in D.C. where he's putting up the two fingers for Baphomet, the goat god. I mean, that's the outward thing. That's like a dog lifting his leg and marking his territory. The devil marks his territory. And you see it everywhere. You see international corporations in their symbols. It will be a satanic symbol. They honor their God. Okay, I'm, they're not hiding it. It's right in front of it. It's, how we say, hidden in plain sight. Okay, in verse 10, they have groves in every high hill and under every green tree. The green tree, that's a green movement. That's climate change. It's all a hoax. Every bit of it's a hoax. It's worshiping the creature more than the creator is what they're doing. They're putting man above God. Okay, and then in verse 13, 14, and 15, you see that God doesn't like it, so he does send protesters out. Okay, that's like us street preachers where we protest these things. And we tell people these things. And I'm on the radio, and you know, I'll mention these things. You've got to kind of be sly on the radio in order to say it. You got to kind of come, instead of pop them in the nose with a knuckle, you got to kind of go behind the back of the head, Kunk! like that. Okay, and so, and then verse 16 and 17, these people flat rejected what God said. That's like if you go up to any Christian college or any Christian bookstore and ask them, could you get me a King James Bible? They'll, you one of those? Yeah, I am. Yeah. They don't want to hear about the King James Bible. Moody Bible Institute don't want to hear about it. Moody Bible? No, Moody Bibles Institute. They don't want to hear about it. Okay, they rejected the words of God. They might be saved, nice people and all that stuff. And so what does God do? Verse 18, 19, 20, he gave up. He gave up. Now, what are they doing in secret? Verse 9, in secret. What are they doing behind closed doors? Now, the Bible says that we got to be simple concerning evil, but the Bible does write about some things, so we can read what the Bible says. Ezekiel chapter 8 is some things that were done in secret. Ezekiel lived during the same time. 
And God told Ezekiel, he said, hey, I want you to go look for, I want you to go do something. Ezekiel chapter 8, in verse 3, it says, And he put forth the form of a hand and took me up, took me by the lock of mine head. So a Jewish custom was, you know, big head of hair. And so the Spirit of God picked Ezekiel up by hair, his hair. He had a hair-raising experience. And then just transported him to a certain place. And he said, uh, Zeke, he said, I want you to dig a hole in that wall. So there's a common saying, it's a old hole in the wall. So he dug a hole in that wall and he went inside. And in verse 10, so I went in and saw and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beast. Abominable beast under the Jewish covenant, unclean animals. Or maybe it's the real abominable beast, I don't know. Uh, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So somebody's drawing these pictures on the wall. Verse 11, and there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. The ancient men of the day. The 33rd degree Masons. They're worshiping Allah. And all the paganism. Okay, and then in uh, verse 13, the women are crying about Tammuz, verse 14. I'm sorry, verse, see Tammuz? Tammuz was a historical thing that happened during uh, the time of Babylon. It happened during the time of um, Shem, and it was a mother-son worship. It was a real pagan thing. And they were crying about Tammuz. It was, he would be the child, the product of a mother-son worship relationship. That's who they're crying about. Verse 16, they're worshiping the sun toward the east. Okay, now that's the sunburst. Take notice how the sunburst is everywhere. And often corporate logos, the sunburst. It sometimes will be had like the sunrise. That's a worship of the pagan sun god, Ra. Ra is the name. And you go to a sports game. Ra, Ra, Ra. That's Ra is a pagan sun god. And we're being conditioned about these things. And so the thing is, that's the spiritual aspect. Okay, now, uh, about in 1996, there was a, a fella from Japan that released a card game for kids. It was called Pokemon. Okay, I thought that that thing could kind of run its gamut. And I started hearing kids talk about it here lately. Pokemon was a card game, uh, a kind of a card game, but it was a game that kids played to capture these monsters. Pokemon is two Japanese words put together. The poke is pocket, mon is monster. So as a pocket monster, what they were trying to capture and learning to play with. Now, these monsters are, were said to have special powers, and they share the world with humans. Yeah, that's right, they do. Okay, and the idea of the game was to have the kids learn how to collect as many Pokemon as possible, train them, and use them against other people's Pokemon by invoking the various abilities of each Pokemon creature. Okay, now here's some of the names. Now, two weeks ago, I think it's about two weeks ago, there's they, a new release called Pokemon Go. Okay, Pokemon Go is an interactive thing that is on a cell phone. So these kids are using a GPS. The Pokemon Go is attached to the GPS. And it takes you, it will guide you to a certain location. And then you can capture this little kind of monster. Okay, and then they go trespass to somebody else's property. <laughs> Got to be produced by Bernie Sanders because everything's socialism. Okay, and what is the whole idea of these things? Okay, now here's some of the names of the characters. Okay, Haunter, Haunter, Haunt, Haunted House. Haunter can hypnotize, eat a person's dreams, and drain their energy. Abra reads people's minds. Kadabra emits negative energy that harms others. Ghastly induces sleep. Jengar laughs at people's fright. What's that? That's sadism. 
Uh, Nidoran uses poison. And this psychic type of Pokemon are among the strongest in the games. So these children are learning incantations. They're interacting with it. You say, well, what if they're just, you know, innocent about it? Okay, I know the Lord can uh, bypass some of those things. But concepts of the game include magical stones, teleportation, ghost, all-seeing eye, psychic power, and using of spirits to achieve results in a real world to curse other people. Okay, this is the intended consequence. Now, here's the deception. Pokemon teaches kids that they can make demon-like beings to obey them. It's not obeying them. It's deceiving them. It's pulling them in is what it's doing. They are taught that these demons can be mastered and controlled. They're not mastered and controlled. The control is reversing back on them. It's like a mirror. They are taught that demons are their servants and will help them. No, they, they might temporarily help them until they get the knife out to cut their throat. And they are encouraged to become Pokemon mon- masters by conquering more and more demons. So what they're doing is they become, the ones who are really getting into it are becoming asse- obsessed with it. How obsessed? Well, three police officers just last week was standing beside a car and an SUV plows into the back of the one, the police car parked there, and a guy comes out, I was playing Pokemon Go on my phone, slams into their car. Okay, two, two young fellas down in Florida was trespassing on somebody's property, and one of them said, did you find it yet? And the owner heard that, assumed two thieves, runs outside with his handgun, and they're in the car, and he's got the gun on them. Told them to stop, and they took off running. He shot the car, and nobody got injured. Two in California, following Pokemon, walk past a no trespassing sign, walk past, and fell down a 90-foot cliff, Yeah, that stupid is as stupid does. Fortunately, they get killed. What they're being obsessed by these things, and that's the slavery of it. I can imagine where they're going to pull these things. Brent says, uh, BIMI, the mission board that he's a part of, he said they're having a problem in Chattanooga where these kids are coming on their property. Who do we find them out here? Or what if Pokemon arranges that a certain devil is in a certain church building and they, oh, I gotta go get this deal. Ooh. And then they're in there, and when they're in the building, oh, I'll just steal a few things while I'm here. You see, that's what it's doing, it's getting people hooked to a screen. It's what it's getting them to do, hooked to a screen, and it hypnotizes people. People don't realize the power of that screen. And just because I got 10 kills. No, you push buttons. Go out and get a stick and beat your brother up with it. You might get a little more manhood. Okay, I mean, the kids need to get, yeah, they say Pokemon helps you get out. Yeah, get out without the phone. You know, the camp, the kids had camp last week. No electronic equipment. Probably the best week of their year. I went to my, can you believe it, 40th class reunion. They all looked old, but not me. They all changed, not me. But my one friend, he said, I don't know why my son puts these little movies in the car for the kids. He said, when they they ride with Grandpa, I put everything in the glove box, and we play the alphabet game, and we talk. (laughs) He said, we have a good time. And I'm not saying you should never do that, but still the idea is we've got to have a balance in life. And as believers, what do we do about this? Okay, uh, we have the glorious power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of God to overcome the sin and bondage that these people are getting into. 
And the darker things become, the brighter our light should be showing. Okay, we should be praying for others. We should warn some of these unsuspecting parents. And maybe our grandkids, you know, just humbly, oh, did, did you see, please, please look into this. Uh, we should soak your house in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, you should soak yourself in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and your family against unclean spirits. I am amazed at how preachers don't talk about spirits. Meaning, they don't know what to do with these things, and they don't consider them. I'm not saying that we should look under every rock, and maybe there's a little devil underneath there. Well, I'm not saying that. But uh, spirits are like flies, and we need to know what to do. We don't put up a shingle and say, you know, we cast out unclean spirits. Whenever anybody puts up a shingle and majors in that, they've been infested themselves. But when the Lord crossed it, the maniac of Gadara, the, the maniac of Gadara, there was a part of him that wanted out. There was a part of him that wanted to stay in. But when he crossed the Lord Jesus Christ, he got out. And he got in his right mind, he put his clothes back on, he went back to his family and said, what happened to you? I met Jesus Christ. And I tell you, these people are going to be bound in these things and when they become desperate enough, they need to find somebody to be able to help them. Ephesians chapter 6 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, that's who we're wrestling against. Okay, and we need to put on the whole armor of God. And when you're dealing with people, you need to be able to recognize... When somebody's infested, watch their eyes. Watch their eyes very closely, and you probably might see something come out, meaning glass over. Why? They've gotten blinded. Their ears, they can't see. You ever hear people say, well, I just can't see it. That's right, you can't see it because you've got spiritual cataracts. And so we need to learn and know how to break through that. Never forget that the believer is more than a conqueror. We don't need to leave, live a defeated life. Okay, you cross somebody who's a Satanist. I worship the devil. You know, that's intended to intimidate. Smile, laugh, and a good, good time. Well, you worship a loser. My God's going to beat your God. Jesus Christ. Does that bother you? I just saw a few circuit breakers go. I could see the fuses were blowing. The Lord Jesus Christ. Pull that out of JW. Man, just watch the circuit breakers go. You see, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And we are more than conquerors. Now, it does say in 1 John, it says that greater is he that's in you that's he that's in the world. But don't, don't take that for granted. We've got to hit the light switch. And the light switch is the word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be a... Learn, know some things, and we got to recognize that spirits are out there. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, grace where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And so we have nothing to fear, but what we should do is recognize an opportunity. Paul said in Acts 26, verse 18, that he was uh, opened their eyes and he delivered them from the power of Satan unto God. And so, as, as people that understand these things, pray for our nation. If God doesn't intervene, it's done. Politicians ain't going to change a thing. You know, Trump's not going to... If Trump is going to try to change something and does bullet there or there, unless God allows... Not, the exception proves the rule, but, you know, it's up to God what he's going to do. But yet it's up to us to pray to that God and beg that God to ask forgiveness, beg that God for mercy. And then when we see the sins of our nation, we need to sigh and cry about it.
what's happened to our country. What's happened to the church? You need to sigh and cry about it. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be alert to these things. Help us to be vigilant soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us not to, uh, help us not to feel like we're going to be overcome. No, the Lord's going to win. You're going to win. There's no questions about that. But the devil is deceiving these folks. They're opening these doors. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be people who can help them come to Christ, close the doors, and be more than a conqueror. And Lord, I do ask you to forgive our nation. I ask for your mercy. I ask for your mercy of, on the church. Lord, I just pray you'd help us to be faithful to your task. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.